Uh, our next speaker for the day is Dr. Rohit Nanivadekar. He completed his master's in wildlife sciences at the Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun, and his PhD from the Nature Conservation Fund and Manipal University. He is currently a scientist at NCF and is interested in frugivory, seed dispersal, and conservation of tropical forests and its inhabitants. The title of his talk is Understanding Ecology and the Ecological Role of Hornbills Using Telemetry. On to you, Dr. Nandanikar. Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to be presenting our research based on the telemetry data on hornbills. At the onset, I would like to sincerely thank the organizers for inviting me for this very interesting mini symposium. Hornbills are fascinating birds. They are among the largest fruit eating birds in Asian tropics. As seed dispersers, they play a pivotal role in the regeneration of. While the unique nesting ecology of hornbills is well known, their roosting ecology is also very fascinating. In Southeast Asia, more than 2,000 plain pouched hornbills are known to roost in forests near the Thailand Malaysia border. This photograph is of the wreath hornbill roost in the Pakhe Tiger Reserve in Northeast India. Reed hornbills are the close relatives of the plain pouched hornbills. Hornbills have been known to use this particular roost site for decades. My PhD mentor, Dr. Aparajita Dutta, based on field observations, had reported that hornbills prefer roosting in open riverine grassland areas or on cliff faces. What drives the roost choice used by hornbills is not known. Also, while watching them almost every evening, we had simple questions like are the same birds coming and roosting here every evening? Roost choice could be driven by distribution of food resources. Hornbills could, could like to roost near areas with greater fruit availability or the roost site could be governed by the presence of key locations like its nest or they might like to roost in areas where the predation and anthropogenic pressures are lower or they might just prefer certain habitats like the riverine habitat. The photograph of the wreath hornbill that I had just shown was formed along the riverside. Therefore, we try to determine whether the roost choice in hornbills is influenced by the distribution of fruit resources or riverine habitat or nest sites. We conducted the study in Pake Tiger Reserve in southwest Arunachal Pradesh in northeast India. Pake is spread over an area of 862 square kilometers. We tried to trap hornbills in and around the Sijusa area in the southeast part of the Pake Tiger Reserve. We spent 17 months trying to trap hornbills using canopy mounted mist nets. We trapped 17 hornbills but tagged only 5 of them. We let go of the female and juvenile birds and the smaller oriental pied hornbill. We used the 55 gram EOPS tags which weighed less than 3% of the hornbill body weight. The tags were programmed to log hornbill locations at 15 minute time intervals during the daytime. Of the 5 birds that we tagged, Four were great hornbills and one was a wreath hornbill. Three birds were breeding birds while two non-breeding great hornbills were also tagged. The number of days for which usable data was available varied between 19 to 72 days. We identified between 3 to 33 different roost sites of the different hornbills. Interestingly, there was some evidence that the non-breeding great hornbills had more number of roosts as compared to the breeding hornbills. Non-breeding hornbills range over more than 50 square kilometers of forest, while the breeding hornbills range only about 2 square kilometers of forest. The wreath hornbill, even in the breeding season, ranged over a very large area, which was similar to the non-breeding great hornbills. Yet, it had relatively fewer roost sites compared to the non-breeding great hornbills. This table shows the mean distance between the roost sites on successive nights, mean number of nights a roost site was used, and the mean number of successive nights when the bird used the same roost. This kind of gives us some idea of roost site fidelity. Typically, birds spent about 4 to 5 nights at the same roost before moving to other one. Interestingly, one non-breeding great hornbill had a very high distance between roost sites on successive nights and the, loosed, and the least roost site fidelity. Do hornbills roost near their foraging areas? Here. We have plotted the time of the day on the x-axis and the mean displacement in 15 minute time intervals on the y-axis for the 5 tagged birds. The breeding great hornbills are in the top row, 
the non bleeding great horn bills are in the middle row and the wreath horn bill is at the bottom left if you notice that every morning and evening before the birds leave or arrive at a roost site there is significant displacement hornbills are known to forage early in the morning and late in the evenings before they come to their roost sites such large displacement indicates that the birds are moving either to or away from their foraging areas in the mornings and evenings respectively this displacement is larger than their daytime displacement clearly indicating that the birds are unlikely roosting near their foraging areas do hornbills roost near riverine areas here on the x axis are the five individual birds the wreath hornbill is on the extreme right shown in the lighter gray color on the y axis the distance of the roost to the river is shown in meters what you clearly see is that the great hornbills individuals that we had tagged did not particularly roost near the river side they might do so occasionally on the other hand the wreath hornbill consistently roosted near the river side the same is evident from the google earth image shown on the left where the roost locations are shown in red and yellow points most of the roost locations are near the river the yellow pins with a star are the most used roost sites if you remember the picture from the beginning of the roost site or the wreath hornbill this is the location of that particular roost site do hornbills roost near their nests given the unique breeding biology of hornbills where the parent birds invest so much in rearing a single chick it is possible that male birds might roost near the nest here on the x axis are the three breeding hornbills on the y axis we have plotted the distance of the roost to the nest in meters the box on the extreme right is that of the wreath hornbill in lighter gray you can see that hornbills on average roost more than 400 meters away from their nest here in the google map image the nest the nest of the wreath hornbill is at the location within the red circle you can see that most of the roost locations are away from the nest so what do we know about the roosting ecology of hornbills we still know very little what we know is that the roost sites are not likely influenced by the nests and fruit rich areas wreath hornbill did prefer roosting near the river the reasons for which need to be determined in future studies now let's move on to understanding the ecological role of hornbill more than 90% of hornbill diet is fruits aparajita's research demonstrated that hornbills do not damage the seeds may they be large or small for many species the gut treatment of hornbills actually enhances their germination aparajita also found that hornbills disperse a lot of seeds under the roost and the nest sites at nest sites the females keep regurgitating the seeds that accumulate under the nest this results in clumped dispersal of seeds what she found is that the clumped dispersal of seeds under nest and roost sites does not necessarily enhance the regeneration of plants seeds and saplings here face significant pressures from seed predators unfavorable climate and herbivores respect during my phd i focused on the number of seeds dispersed by hornbills on forest floor away from their nests or roosts I found that hornbills could be scattered dispersing seeds on average up to 3000 seeds per day per square kilometer and these are only the large seeds that I am talking about these seeds are scattered dispersed in the forest during the day in numbers between 1 to 2 seeds per plot additionally we were not aware how far are the seeds dispersed by hornbills with increasing forest fragmentation and climate change hornbills can potentially play a pivotal role in connecting plant subpopulations by moving seeds between the different subpopulations they can also help plants in upward movement with increasing temperatures this can only be achieved if hornbills are found to move seeds at larger distances long range seed dispersers are a rarity and we wanted to figure out if hornbills are one of them therefore we asked the following questions what are the seed dispersal distances of hornbills what proportion of seeds are dispersed at the nest and the roost site while we had the movement data at 15 minute time interval which is about the time that the hornbill spend on fruiting trees we also needed gut retention time data to determine the seed dispersal distances of hornbills ushma and akanksha diligently collected this data from captive birds in nagaland zoo This table shows the median gut retention times for five large seeded plants 
and you can see that the re gut retention times are between 85 to 155 minutes. We use this gut retention time data, the final scale movement data and the frugivore activity pattern data to generate the seed dispersal kernels. This box and whisker, whisker plot shows the median seed dispersal distances for the breeding and non-breeding great hornbills. The median dispersal distances are around 250 to 300 meters. Interestingly, the non-breeding birds which range over larger distances have a long tail where they occasionally disperse seeds up to 13 kilometers from the parent tree. The breeding wreath hornbill had the median dispersal distance of more than 1 km and was also occasionally dispersing seeds beyond 10 km from the parent tree. This is the location heat map for one of the great hornbills. The area to the north and the west of the river is belongs to the Pake and Namiri Tiger Reserve, while area to the east and south of the river is all reserve forests. You can see that the great hornbill has moved outside the protected area on multiple occasions. Similar pattern can be seen in the case of wreath hornbills. It is likely that hornbills are moving seeds between protected area and the adjoining degraded forests. This particular figure shows the distance classes from the parent fruiting tree on x-axis and the probability of seed arrival in the different distance class intervals on the y-axis. You can see that the probability of seed arrival under the parent tree is very very low. The probability of seed arrival under non-nest sites is shown in light grey while at the nest sites is shown in black within the bar. This is the data shown for two of the five hornbills. We found similar patterns for other individuals. You can see that the relative proportion of seeds dispersed at nest sites is a tiny fraction of seeds that are being dispersed. Therefore, we can conclude that male hornbills are mostly dispersing the seeds in the forest away from the trees. This stacked bar plot shows the relative proportion of seeds that are dispersed at roost sites in lighter grey and non-roost sites in darker grey. Again, you can see that less than 10% of seeds are dispersed at the roost site. So this allowed us to conclude that only a small fraction of seeds are dispersed by male hornbills at unfavorable sites, that is the nests and the roosts. This and our other studies demonstrate that most seeds are scattered dispersed on the forest floor by hornbills, which are likely to be favorable sites for seed germination. This also shows that, plant, that hornbills play a key role in seed dispersal by also demonstrating large long distance seed dispersal. We spent 17 months trying to catch hornbills. We managed to trap only on 15 of those days. The movement data was among the first of its kind for these species and has given some novel insights into Asian hornbill ecology. However, we learned tremendously more about hornbills on the days we failed to catch them. That fortunately or unfortunately has not been captured in papers yet, but has helped us plan future studies. Most importantly, we made friendships while we were devising plans to trap these words. Unfortunately, we have lost two of the main team members who played a key role in the study. Tully and Kumar are no longer with us. Here on the right is a picture of Tully with a great hornbill. Tully and Kumar, this work is dedicated to their fellowship and their love for hornbills. It was a quite a challenging project. It took us almost two and a half years for the grant to materialize. It took us one more year for the research permissions from the Forest Department and TCA and Ministry of Environment for, and Forests to come through. It was seven, 17 months of field work, but we got data for five birds. Journals were not happy. They want larger sample sizes. But the challenges in the field to catch these smart birds are immense. Very, very difficult to trap these birds in Northeast. This was a high voltage work. We were tensed when we didn't trap birds because we worried we are not getting any data. When we had them in our hands, it was a tense experience given holding such large magnificent birds. And after we released them, on occasions when we could not find them for days, we were also tense days when we thought that whether we had lost these birds. So all of it, however, in retrospect, was a great learning experience. We learned so much more about hornbill ecology 
in the times that we spent in field watching and trying to tap, trap them and tag them. All the data that I've just presented is all publicly available, including the movement data, the gut retention time data and other data. This work is possible because we got immense support from the Thailand Hornbill project team. They taught us more than trapping and tagging hornbills. We are immensely grateful to them. We are grateful to SERB for the grant to Dr. Aparajita that supported this work. We had a fantastic field team of local field assistants, researchers and volunteers. I am proud to say that three of the researchers who worked with us have gone ahead and carved a career for themselves in the field of movement ecology. Akanksha, Ushma and Mahalesri. We got a lot of support from our colleagues and friends for, to whom we are immensely grateful. I would like to thank you all for your patience and I am happy to take questions. Thanks a lot. Fantastic, Rohit. So somehow we see like hornbill groups of rubicos, ornithologists, Rohit. have like trumped the others. Like this somehow is such a fantastic set of work. And, from, and I guess like his last slide already displayed the key people to contact. So if we have budding ornithologists who want to learn about like taking small steps. So telemetry is just a tool. So before we get fascinated about it, I guess multiple talks about the same set of study must have allowed you to percolate how much of effort goes in. So don't get fooled by the tool is what uh, Rohit was trying to say you through like various stages. So Rohit, we have a single question or we have another question. We'll take them. Nishant has asked an interesting questions about the sociality of hornbills. At times we see them hopping in certain groups. And he wants to understand how frequently do they fly together or like do they showcase fidelity to roosting or feeding sites? So do we have such information with you? Thanks. Oh, that's a very interesting question. Thanks a lot, Ashant, for that. Um, so let me break this down into multiple questions that are there. Uh, one is about the sociality. So for example, the reed thornbills and several other uh, righty seros thornbills are known to roost in large flocks. And therefore, they are very, very social. And, uh, you know, similar patterns you also see for the great hornbills and occasionally for other hornbill species as well. So they are definitely a lot uh, social, especially when they're roosting. And uh, regarding their fidelity to foraging trees, yes, we have seen patterns where, for example, in the breeding season, uh, these are great hornbills at smaller home ranges and they would have a few trees within their home range, which they would frequently visit and they would feed from there. So they also show some foraging site fidelity. In the, in, unlike the great hornbill, the reed hornbill was even more interesting. You know? The great hornbill nest and the reed hornbill nest, in fact, was within a few hundred meters from each other. And we tagged these birds at around the same time, the first great hornbill and the first reed hornbill that we tagged. And interestingly, while the great hornbill was uh, ranging over only an area of two square kilometers, the reed hornbill was in fact traveling over an area, ranging over an area of about 50 square kilometers. It was going outside Parquet Raiga Reserve in the distant reserve forests. It was also going into other parts of Parquet and further parts of Namiri as well. So it was really, you know, um, ranging over a much large distance. So technically, I would think that, you know, if you compare it with the Great Hornbill, the fruit resources, the Great Hornbill was able to uh, nest successfully there. And the Great Hornbill should have also been able to find fruits in the close vicinity, but it really ranged over large areas. Now, why they do this is something that we still need to unravel. There are probably evolutionary and ecological factors that drive uh, these ranging patterns and that need to be explored in future studies. But uh, yes, even uh, they do show some fidelity for foraging sites. They do show some fidelity for the roost sites. You notice that the great reef thornbill was ranging over large areas, yet it had, was roosting only in about 10 different sites, out of which two sites it particularly preferred to roost. And it was making large distance uh, displacements to and fro from uh, it's foraging sites to the roost sites. So there is evidence for some site fidelity in, in the hotbills. All right. Thank you, Dr. Nani Vadekar. That was a really great session. Um, next, the, 
the remaining questions will be answered on Discord since uh, the questions would be visible by both uh, attendees and speakers at a later time as well.